Hello, my name is Cristobal Cobo. I'm a senior education technology specialist at the World Bank, and I'm very pleased to be with you to discuss some key ideas about blended learning. So let me dive right into that. So blended learning can be structured under four key pillars, time, space, interaction, and modality. We can have learning experience at the same time or at different time, as synchronous or asynchronous, so to speak. Uh, we can learn in the same space or we can learn remotely. We can learn in one-to-one -one interaction, one-to-few or many-to-many -many kind of interaction. And that will also be definitely influenced by the kind of technology we use. So different technology will offer different modalities of learning. Now, um, that really offers a wealth of flexibility and opportunities during the learning experience. But at, at the same time, that flexibility will require to provide some deliberate guidance and structure for the teachers, which will be designing the learning experience, but also for the students to know how to navigate um, in this environment where they have much more agency and autonomy for deciding uh, when and how to learn. And that's going to be critical. But at the same time, it's going to be essential that we design strategies to su provide support to those students who might be under more vulnerable situation. So this higher levels of flexibility will have to be enriched at the same time with higher levels of structure and guidance, and also with higher levels of autonomy to discuss and reflect how to better integrate this technology in different contexts. So we know that technology uh, has been playing an increasingly relevant role in education. But at the same time, there are different combinations of technology and different opportunities, which are the ones that I would like to highlight here, because I think there's plenty of opportunities for reimagined education. So let me share some key concepts here that I think can be useful. So we have digital learning, which is the larger umbrella. Digital learning is basically a learning that is enriched with technology and it, it encompasses um, online learning, blended learning, and hybrid learning. Now, the online learning, it does require access to the internet and it can be learned at any time or any place. Uh, now, the blended learning combines face-to-face -face with in-person learning, and that also offers the students to engage um, in the same activities regardless of the space. Now, hybrid learning on the other side, it offers higher levels of flexibility where the online and the face-to-face -face will be uh, much more better integrated because the nature of the context is going to play a key role to decide what can be learned online, what should be learned in person, what should be synchronous and what should be asynchronous. Now, in hybrid learning, the relevance of the, uh, an appropriate um, pedagogical approach is going to be essential. Um, because the, on the one side, as we said, the teacher's uh, support will be critical, uh, the staff support as well, but that has to be uh, enriched by a pedagogical design that is centered on the student, um, putting the student at the center of the learning experience. Now, learning will require, among other things, that we secure that equity and inclusion will be essential. Now, let me let me say some things about what we have mentioned so far. We can combine same time or different time, um, same space or different space, and different sorts of, of um, interaction. Now, we have collected evidence from so many different countries um, which have approached to those uh, um, different forms of blended learning and in different ways. And I am tempted to say that there's not the right way of implementing blended learning, but it will require um, the right adaptation to the context where this has been integrated. Now, the most traditional way of learning is the face-to-face, -face, the so to speak, offline learning, right? This is, as we know, the traditional learning. Um, th during the last two decades, at least, distant learning or e-learning has been increasing in terms of um, gaining momentum, attention, particularly in higher education. Now, because of the pandemic, because of the diversification of tools for learning, now we are having a much systematic discussion about blended learning and the opportunities it offers. But what I want to emphasize here is what really makes the difference is not the amount of technology we integrate, but the quality of the strategy that we have when we supply that technology with an appropriate pedagogical strategy, with the appropriate support to teachers, and some level of guidance to all the different players who are taking place in this learning experience. So as you can see in this graph, 
we can have technology that can simply replicate what used to be the traditional learning, but with technology, we can also augment some of the capacities of the learners through technology with some tools, but we can go some steps farther, which I think is the most interesting part of the discussion. We can really expand the capacities of the learner and the, and the teacher with technology, and we can really transform. That will mean, to some extent, to mirror the real life learning experience, connecting on and offline learning in a much more um, fluent way to facilitate more uh, diversity. Now, the truth is, as we mentioned earlier, the blended learning is not one model, but it's an, a diversity of different options. Um, as you can see, there's the, so to speak, a flip classroom. Um, some of them are called supplemented blended. Others are high, called high flex or flex model. So we have all these different options. Let me, let me share some key ideas here since it can help us to, to see some of the different kind of flavors that exist in terms of the learning and that I think can be can be of interest for this oh, for this community. So we mentioned, for instance, the the flex model. So in the flex model, the digital platforms are used to deliver most of the curriculum, but in a set location, usually the classroom. On the other side, the flipped classroom, the students are at first introduced to the course at home, and then they continue the learning experience. Uh, in a classroom. On the other side, the inside out blended is an opportunity where the learning goes beyond the physical classroom, but it still includes both face to face and online learning. And it tends to go through a project based learning experience. So what we find here is different doses of online in person uh, with higher lower levels of agency and autonomy from the learning experience. But it, what is going to be critical is the instructional design and the strategy that teachers will provide to the students to know how to use these different options. So I think in that sense here, it's important to understand that the face-to-face -face is going to be a critical component. And when the face-to-face -face is not possible, to have regular interaction with the students, uh, systematic interaction plays a, an essential role. Second, the quality of the digital learning resources is going to be essential. Um, and at the same time, to provide guidance on the structure, independent study time the students will have when they, wait, when they are remotely. And that has to do, as we said, with agency uh, and with the capacity of self-regulated learning experience. Now, there are a number of key components to make that happen. Some of the enabling conditions may have to do with the physical infrastructure, what is going to be the role of the school, um, how the school administrators and the managers will provide the conditions to make that happen, what is expected from the students and what is the kind of learning that they, had, they will have to have, and at the same time, to what extent the contents which are provided will facilitate this um, blended learning experience. But there are some structural conditions like the infrastructure and at the same time the governance. Many of the focus tend to be in two key components, the technology and at the same time the pedagogical adaptations, which trust me, are essential, but at the same time, there are other key enabling factors, like the appropriate trainings that teachers will receive, the financial support that some communities will require to get on track, um, the pedagogical guidance and the technological availability, but at the same time, the technological proficiency. So there's all these components that are going to be essential to make the, the blended learning effective. Now, we have emphasized the importance of having a contextualized, a contextually relevant blended learning experience. And that will have to do, among others, with identifying, having an appropriate diagnostic to identify where there is access to a high bandwidth, um, when there is only access to low bandwidth or no access to connectivity. And at the same time, based on that, we can really define what can be learned synchronously and what can be learned asynchronously. So with that, we can build a map of options in terms of what are the things that can be uh, ideally gone through, for, for instance, video conferencing, high broadband, high uh, uh, synchronous options and real time kind of interaction. And what are the things that should be considered to offer in asynchronous environments, which are not necessarily worse than the synchronous. We all know about the Zoom fatigue and the excessive use of synchronous video conferencing. So I think uh, the right balance between 
the infrastructure and the context and the conditions for learning are going to be critical to design an appropriate blender learning experience. So there's so many attributes about digital technology and technology to support learning that are essential. Um, I'm not going to go in full detail on each one of them because I think we are, after two years of the pandemic, we are highly familiarized with some of the opportunities in terms of um, diversifying the options and the capacities. Uh, but at the same time, I think we are fairly aware of the limitations and um, it's no surprise for anyone to say that technology won't replace the face-to-face -face and the human connection interaction, right? So with that in, in mind, we will see and we have observed that there are different approaches to understand the blended learning. Uh, some of them which could be more analog, if you want, combining face-to-face -face with printed materials, radio and television. In other environments, we have seen a massive expansion of that with the integration of mobiles, like uh, SMS, systems. When possible, um, some countries have expanded that with the delivery of pre-recorded um, lessons, which can offer online or offline, with the integration of mobile that can really enrich the learning experience, and in environments where their access to connectivity is systematic. In addition to all what I mentioned, and the live sessions, also we can rely heavily on the use of adaptive systems that can really personalize much more the learning experience of the students. But at the same time, I think it's important to understand that the more advanced we go on the technology, the more likely that we will require to secure some of the key enabling conditions like access to infrastructure, appropriate adaptations to the contents, and to secure that teachers and students will have the needed digital skills for that. Now, let me, let me say that when we kind of try to understand the enabling conditions, we can unpack them in two key areas. The infrastructure ones, which are related, as we said, um, with the access to connectivity, the access to the appropriate devices and the digital learning materials, which should be aligned to the national curriculum and should be adapted to students with special needs. But on the other side, it will require a lot of uh, follow up um, and securing that the human capital of the different players and actors will be available or support will be at hand. Um, in terms of the school management, in terms of the needed um, strategies, capacities and skill and the skills that teachers will need. And at the same time, the support and guidance that students will require in terms of regular feedback, regular monitoring, follow up. And as we mentioned earlier, learning how to learn and how to administrate the learning is going to be critical. Now, let me let me pass through a, a different chapter that I think is essential, which are some of the research evidence that will be important to take into account. Now, when we observe what has been happening in terms of um, remote learning, for instance, we, we have identified that in different countries which offer a number of resources for learning remotely, um, there has been um, um, a reduction in terms of the attention among some of the resources. One clear case that we have seen consistently in different countries is the engagement with um, learning materials through television when there is not an additional action to support. So the question we should ask to ourselves is how to design a blended learning material where the engagement, the attention and the participation does not decrease along the time. And I think that's going to be essential. The pandemic has shown us that the Education, educational technology is not necessarily better than in person. And in cases like, for instance, Switzerland, we have seen that the learning remotely is uh, slower than the, the learning in person. In the case of Netherlands, where the access to infrastructure is, is quite abundant, we have seen that there's a learning loss um, significant, even in the first week of the remote learning. Or in the case of, Sa in the case of Sao Paulo in Brazil as well, we have seen uh, in fifth grader students um, when they when this compared with students which learn in person, there are significant gaps um, between this between those who learn remotely and those who learn in person. So edtech is not necessarily better than um, in person, but when what is it integrated, it really can be a good enabler and can really increase the flexibility that in many cases this pandemic has required. But if actions are not taken, one of the big risks that we observe is that it can amplify or worsening the pre-existing inequality. So a good design will require to have some supporting strategies to address those who might need it the most. So for instance, in China, we have observed through um, studies that um, 
the remote instruction might be beneficial in compared to no instruction whatsoever. But however, it might not be a good idea to rely only on substituting the in-person with the remote learning, because then when we, we what, what we have observed is the impact is not really significant. Now, teachers highly prepared, they do play a key role here because they can really be a game changer. And that really offered opportunities to think what are the what is the support that highly qualified teachers can offer to those who might be requiring more assistance or support. And at the same time, there have been interesting studies identifying that high quality um, high quality um, live stream might not necessarily lead to high quality learning. So I think there are so many key components to take into account when we think about the impact of remote learning that in that sense, we will have to go through uh, an accurate and appropriate um, monitoring strategy. But there are different paradigms for monitoring. Um, we can monitor based on key principles that we might identify as critical. We can monitor based on key components that we might think is, are important within the blended learning, or we can monitor based on key capacities. I'm going to illustrate some examples. I would say that an integration of these different approaches is going to be essential. So when we go on principles, we can identify principles like access, equity, relevance, or quality. And within each one of these, we will go into a specific components, which is like the level of enrollment, the attendance of the students, the, the percentage of students who might have access to infrastructure. In the case of the relevance, we can see to what extent the concepts have been adapted to these conditions, but also can be uh, well aligned with the national curriculum. And in terms of equity, for instance, which are the students who might be in a much more vulnerable uh, situation, whether there is a, a, a gender gap or the, or the students who might need extra support, whether they have the conditions to get that support. Um, so these are some of the components that are going to be incredibly important when we want to address the idea of um, monitoring the fine mind principles as well in, in the case of the quality, no? uh, whether the size of the classroom makes a different uh, in terms of the performance or the, the a difference in terms of the quality of the learning experience, to what extent we have increased or decrease of the engagement of, this, of those learners who might be learning remotely or uh, in, under blended conditions. So all these components are going to be important, but I just mentioned the ones that have to do with uh, monitoring the fine by principles, but we can identify gaps as well in the monitoring the fine by components. So as the EdTech have suggested, we can focus uh, the blended learning experience, focusing on identifying the quality of the infrastructure provide, or the quality of the teaching and learning materials, or the quality of the teacher training and development, or the quality of the instructional practices, or the, to what extent it can be improved the quality of the learning, or whether there is an appropriate teacher support network, or how we, what is the role that parents are, are playing. It's unlikely that we will be able to collect all this information with a single instrument, so it's, it's quite possible that we will have to require um, a comprehensive data collection strategy to, to get inputs from all these um, different components. But at the same time, this can be enriched by what I mentioned earlier. So monitoring by components, monitoring by principles. And also there's another approach, which is monitoring based on the capacities. So there are different instruments today um, in the world that highlight the importance of monitoring the uh, teachers' proficiency when they teach online, not only to develop some skills, but also to adapt the pedagogical strategies to teach remotely. So today there is a, a wealth of options in terms of instruments that you that you can find. Digital uh, uh, Digicom in the European context is broadly used, but also there are other instruments like the World Bank Teach and Coach, and also um, you will find others like what UNESCO or Profuturo has been offering, among many others. Each one of them has strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so it's up to you to decide which is the one that you would like to adopt. In any case, I strongly recommend to have a strategy in this regard and to see which is the available instrument that really collects more of the information that is critical for you. So let me conclude saying that when we go for blended learning, it's going to be interesting that this diversity of options will also will require um, to design um, mitigation strategies to reduce the existing gaps, to provide clear guidance, and to offer assistance to those who might need. I would say when we want to understand whether blended learning is going in the direction we want, we have to consider at least the four princi principles, outcomes, reach, quality assurance, and engagement. 
uh, being engagement an important one since what we could have in the moment in the time one, it might not be sustained in the time two. At the same time, which is going to be ex really important to see whether we are benefiting the most of the students or we have some communities who might be left out. What are the outcomes? Can we expect the same learning outcomes as in-person learning? If so, what are the things that really make the difference? And quality assurance um, will have to do with the quality of the adaptation to these uh, new settings. Uh, in many cases, there has been adaptations in terms of the contents and the strategies, and I do believe that this is important. So I think we have to go beyond the inputs in terms of what people are using and how much are they using, and we have to address all these other dimensions that are going to be essential the quality of the materials, the quality of the, environment, the learning environments, bring um, a closer look into the, the type of interactions that the community is having. And that will require to combine formative and summative assessment, but also understanding that the flexibility will require additional support. So let me stop here and invite you to reflect on the opportunities that blended learning might offer. Thank you very much.